This episode of Because Science is sponsored by Borderlands 3. The universe has a speed limit. No thing can travel faster than the speed of light. But that depends on exactly what you mean by thing. Let's get technical. Light speed, the speed at which photons travel through a perfect void, is our universe at maximum pace. And only light or other massless objects can travel at this equal in all reference frames speed. For anything with mass, for anything with some chonk to it, it just can't get here. Oh, but we've gotten close. For example, the protons flung around the giant atom smasher below Geneva, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider, can get within 3.1 meters per second of the speed of light. However, because these protons have some mass, they will never get 3.1 meters per second faster. Light speed is a hard limit for stuff with mass, but this does not mean that there aren't phenomena that can travel faster than light. You just have to change your perspective a bit. Before we get to all that weirdness though, why can't objects with mass travel at or beyond the speed of light? Well, that's because of the implications of the most famous equation in human history. E equals mc squared. The energy of a body is equal to its mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. You've You've probably, that was weird, you've probably seen this equation before, but this equation is only totally true when an object isn't moving. The total energy of an object will change if that object is moving, and so you can also derive this form of the famous equation, one that takes into account the object's velocity in relation to the speed of light. If you do a little bit of algebra, you can solve for velocity in this context, and you see that no matter how much energy you add to a body with mass, this part of the equation will always be less than one, which means that no matter how big this energy gets, it's always gonna be some fraction of c and never c itself, the speed of light, or beyond c. To do that, you would need infinite energy, and we know that's just not possible. Sorry. There are more fundamental problems with being able to travel faster than the speed of light, too. This is a light cone. We've talked about it before on this program, but to get you up to speed, a light cone is a way of tracing your space-time history in X, Y, Z, and time coordinates. So this is every possible location you could have been are or will be. Down here are all of your possible pasts, and up here are all your possible futures. If you were to collect every single space-time coordinate for the history of your life and plot them on a graph like this, you would create what's called a world line, basically your history throughout this universe in space-time. Notice that this world line goes within our light cone, and that's because the boundaries for travel in space-time are sensibly set at the speed of light. Now, if you could travel FTL or faster than light, it would imply that there are now possible space-time paths that could exit this light cone. And that would mean that there is a way for you to travel back into your own past, literally, in space-time. This would violate causality itself and lead to a number of famous paradoxes, like being able to go back in time into your own past and eliminate yourself yourself in the past, which means you wouldn't be able to exist in the future to go back into your own past to do what I just did and eliminate yourself in the past, which means you couldn't be in the... This is something that the universe doesn't seem like it wants to be able to happen. Ugh. Like we said, these rules apply to objects with mass, but they also apply to information. For example, Mars is far enough away from Earth that we will never be able to communicate instantaneously with the planet. Even if we were to make a phone call to Mars, maybe asking for something like an orbital strike or I don't know, it would take necessarily between 6 and 44 minutes to get a response to your question or your request. And so no physical things can travel FTL. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't non-massive, non-information phenomena that can break, apparently, this universal speed limit. Oh, I was roaming. Oh, shh. If you change your perspective, there are processes that can travel faster than light. Much faster. 
Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. Not only is it very luminous, it is also relatively close, just 2.6 parsecs away, or about eight light years if you're Han Solo and you don't know what a parsec actually is. We see Sirius every night, but as the sun rotates, Sirius disappears, and then about 24 hours later, it returns. Now from Earth, if we change our frame of reference to be as though we are stationary and the rest of the universe is moving around us, we can observe Sirius traveling along in a circle around us with a light years long radius once every 24 hours. Do the math for this very specific frame of reference and you find that Sirius to complete this motion around us would have to be traveling at around 20,000 times faster than the speed of light. Relativity is not being broken here. No information or matter is actually traveling this fast. However, this is an apparent faster than light phenomenon. Why, you just mention relativity and that happens? Another often mentioned example of an apparent violation of the speed of light is the speed of dark. Consider building a light source so big and so powerful that it could illuminate the entire moon. Now think about moving your hand in front of that light. It might only take a fraction of a second, but the shadow that your hand creates in front of this light will also cross the surface of the moon in just that fraction of a second. In this scenario, if you move your hand fast enough, you can make a shadow on the moon move FTL. And there are even more weird examples like this. Right now, we know that the universe is expanding and it's expanding so quickly, accelerating as it does so, that some galaxies are racing away from us at beyond light speed. And because of the weirdness that is quantum mechanics, we know that we could, for example, take two particles that were entangled and separate them by billions of light years and then measure them, and they would appear to communicate instantaneously across all of that space obviously faster than the speed of light. Again, these processes feel like things, but causality is not being violated here. Hey, get out of my future past. My favorite example of a faster than light phenomenon though, one that feels a lot more real, has to be the case of the superluminal scissors. You've probably used a scissors before in your life, but you may not have noticed something weird that happens when you close them. Look closely at the point where the blades intersect. Now watch how that point moves as I close the scissors. The point at which the blades intersect actually moves faster than the blades themselves. This is kind of weird, right? Now let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine a giant pair of space scissors, not planet cutters, space scissors that would have blades each one light year long. If we then close these scissors like a normal scissors, maybe in less than a second, then the cutting point between those two blades would necessarily move a light year in less than a second, which is obviously faster than the speed of light. In reality, if you tried to make this object in space, it wouldn't work because when you pushed on the molecules in the handle, the information of that push could only travel at the speed of sound through that material and at the fastest, the speed of information, the speed of light. So you wouldn't be able to make this. To make this a reality, you'd have to get the blades moving all at once under a single force. Hmm. What we're describing here is a different kind of cutting implement, one that can superluminally slice through objects. The faster than light guillotine. Let's look at a non-gory diagram of how a guillotine cuts something. When a guillotine is released, the blade comes downwards with some velocity v. It then crosses the cutting plane, here the x-axis, and the point at which the blade intersects with what is being cut will move across this plane with some speed, just like the scissors. The speed of this cutting point as it moves across the plane will depend on geometry, and so we are gonna use the cotangent of the blade angle to get at this cutting point speed, partly because you can use the relationship that is formed by this geometry and the velocity vectors to get at that, and partly because I read a paper that did the same thing. It's mostly that. If we want the cutting point to move across this plane at at least the speed of light or faster, we can rearrange and get a new equation that tells us just how quickly the blade needs to move downwards and what the blade angle should be. And then, and then we can create a the FTL guillotine. If, if you're into that sort of thing. On Earth, a guillotine falls 
under the influence of gravity with a final velocity of the blade dependent on the apparatus holding that blade and its height. From French guillotines that were used all the way up until the first Star Wars movie came out, yep, they used them for a long time, we know that this final head chopping velocity is around six meters per second. So let's plug this in. Do that and we get just one millionth of one degree, an unbelievably small angle. This will create a not really normal looking guillotine. This guillotine would be extremely thin and the blade would look almost parallel to the ground across its length. But let's say we still want to build a faster than light guillotine and we can engineer angles this precise. How wide would the blade have to be? If the far end of this guillotine blade came down as far as a normal guillotine blade did, say a third of a meter or about a foot, then because of this extremely small angle, it would force the guillotine to be unbelievably wide, like wider than the planet Earth. If you built a space guillotine that came down this far and was wider than 14 and a half thousand kilometers and dropped it at typical France head chopping speeds, then it would have a cutting point that would move across and through objects at faster than the speed of light. Obviously though, building a planet chopping guillotine just to demonstrate an illusion of breaking special relativity is kind of a super villainy thing to do. So maybe we can bring these numbers down a bit. And I'm not a supervillain. I'm not. If anyone knows it, it's me. Our FTL guillotine only has ridiculous dimensions because the blade is moving downwards so slowly. So what if, and I cannot stress enough that I'm not a supervillain here, what if we put rockets on our space guillotine? The top speed of a Saturn V rocket is a blistering 18 kilometers per second. If we put those rockets on our space blade or something close to that thrust and accelerated it up to this top speed, then our blade angle would increase by a factor of a thousand and our required width would come way down. Instead of 15,000 kilometers wide, our new and improved model would only have to be five. Sure, we wouldn't have a planet chopper anymore, but we would have a much more reasonable three mile wide space blade moving at 40,000 miles per hour with a cutting point that passed through objects at faster than light itself. We could build something like this with today's technology. I'm not saying that we should. I'm just saying that it would be totally awesome and not evil. It's not. So even though nothing that we've talked about today actually violates special relativity, we can imagine scenarios where not information, no objects, but reference points go faster than the speed of light. We can observe some of these FTL phenomena right now and we might be able to build others in the future. If not something that's actually happening, these examples are at the very least fun thought experiments and maybe future space megastructures. You will not break causality with an FTL guillotine, but you will certainly break something. Because science- oh! Feynman's follicles, you scared me. You know, if you had a space guillotine and you could make it move as fast as like our Helios 2 probe, then the length of the blade would only need to be about 100 meters or so, the length of a football field, and then it would cut stuff at the speed of light. That would probably be cool. Yes, hello, Orbital Strike Command. Mars speaking. Hello. Hello! Answer the phone, you coward! Nope. No one there. Thanks again to Borderlands 3 for sponsoring today's episode. The original shooter looter is back and bigger than ever. With four all new vault hunters and over one billion guns, it's time to lock, load, and loot. Pick up your copy on Xbox One, PS4, or PC now. Let's make some mayhem. Rated M for Mature. Thank you so much for watching, Beckett. If you like this episode, you'll probably like some of our other totally not super villainy episodes like Should We Nuke Mars and What Is Project Thor? If you want to interact with me or the show, send us ideas for future episodes, you can follow us on these social media handles here. Thanks.